Good morning. We're continuing with Rabbi Yonas and Steif's holy work, Mitzvah Hashem, in which he goes through in great detail to explain the commandments that apply to every single human being. And we're considering now all the commandments that fall into the general category of not worshipping idols, which is a prohibition for every single, every single human being is prohibited from worshipping idols. Our goal and obligation is to get this message to every single human being. Not only can you share this, but help us get it out there. Please support and donate to help this work. We need your help to get it to every single human being. This is essential action we could all take. It's not possible for any human being to be enslaved and under the terror of other human beings. And it can be stopped immediately as soon as we get this message to every single human being. And everyone will take action. Donate at rabbismith.org. We are in chapter 35, which says don't walk in the ways of those nations that their practices are foreign to the service of God Almighty. And you can see here on the screen, page 352, and we are in paragraph Yud, in the 10th paragraph, I am Tomid. see in the tractate, Tomid, and it says, It says over there that they would not tie together the, the legs of the tole. The tole is the lamb. In order that we should not go in the ways of the nations. So what happens is that the ways that the nations, that the idol idolaters, would slaughter their animals for their, their animal sacrifices, that they would tie all four legs together and then bring that um bring that as a sacrifice. So it says over here, don't do that. Instead, what they would do is fasten, they would tie. Since you had to immobilize the animal, you would tie the back leg to the front leg. That would be one tying. And then tie the other back leg to the foreleg. So let's say right left, right side, back leg to foreleg. And on the left side, back leg to foreleg. So now you'd have two tyings. And that's the way it should be done. So it should not be, because it says over here, because they were the way that idolaters would bring their sacrifices to idolatry, they would tie together. They would, they would tie together these in this way, the four legs together, yachad together. Because the Rambam, the Rambam writes on this in the, um, in his Mishnah Torah, shelo hayakrifsim hatala, shelo yachaku haapikorsim. Don't do it the way the idolaters do, so that it's not going to become now subject of, of debate with the deniers of God. Meaning to say, the ways of these certain practices that were being carried out don't go in those ways. So we could see from this that even the service in the Holy Temple, where you might say, listen, the, what's wrong with... <clears throat> Tying the animal's legs to all four legs together. This is a so so what did the idolaters do this? This is the way, it's a convenient way to do things. So we see the degree to which we go to make sure we don't emulate the ways of the those that their services performed to God Almighty. We don't even go, we don't even emulate them in any way whatsoever, even to the extent of having to tie the legs twice <coughs> and use more, excuse me, use more. That's obviously more effort, more string. You have to do tying twice, two, uh, twice as many knots, tie twice as much string, or yeah, at least twice as much string. So um, so this is what we do. We make sure not to do things that are going to be in any way comparable. And we see that also in the next um, paragraph, Yud Aleph, Uba Chulin, in the Talmudic tractate, Chulin, on the 41st page on the second side, Aminam B'Shuk Lo Yasaken, we say that in the marketplace, don't do the following. Don't create, don't shech, don't do not slaughter an animal outside of a pit. 
uh, a, 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 de a depression in the ground. And then the dam, the blood will fall, will flow from the animal onto the ground. And from there will flow into this receptacle that's been created, that's in the ground. That the tzaddikim are not going to now start saying that you're doing things for the wrong reasons. Now, what's over here? What's the issue? So the, the Gemara and Chulin says a number of things that are forbidden that should not be done. And, for example, says in the Mishnah, one may not slaughter an animal and have its blood flow into... Uh, let's see, one second here. <clears throat> it says the Mishnah teaches, one may not slaughter an animal and have its blood flow neither into the seas, nor into rivers, nor into vessels, but one may slaughter an animal and have its blood flow into round excavation containing water. So, what's the problem with slaughtering an animal and having the blood flow from the shore into the water because someone is going to look on onlooker is going to say that person is slaughtering this animal as a sacrifice to the angel of the sea that's a possibility a person could say that so <clears throat> then the question that Gamar asks well if that's the case um then you should also be prohibited to slaughter an animal and have the blood flow into a small opening in the ground, a small hole in the ground, a small uh, depression in the ground where there's water in it because maybe the person is going to say that a person is slaughtering to his own reflection, which is similar to idolatry. So the um, answer is, question is whether it also applies to murky water. And there's a whole discussion over here of this, um, what what the what the mission is coming to teach, what the Gugamora has a discussion about this. So, <laughs> what we for our purposes, what we want to understand over here is that even something that is a possibility that someone's going to say, oh, perhaps you're doing it for this reason and misinterpret what you're saying. And in the case of the, the, the Sadaikim, the people that were said, uh, making attacks against the Jewish people, they were mocking the, the they were people that had would only take, let's say, the, the written uh, Torah literally, they would ignore the entire oral Torah. So, um, if you were, they were, they were people that were denying the Torah from Moses, our teacher on Mount Sinai, and they were infiltrators into certain segments of the Jewish population. This belief system infiltrated in. So, it's what well, you might say to yourself: Why should I worry about what they're going to say? Well, the answer is that we have to be careful that even something that could be misassociated, and even by people who are maliciously trying to um, cause problems, then we have to be really careful not to do something that's going to be associated with that. Because it's going to be misinterpreted as somehow that we're endorsing this or we're conducting ourselves this way. To such an extent that we're going to ch make sure that we're not going to slaughter the animal near the sea, so it shouldn't flow into the sea. We're not going to let it flow into a, a pit. And it's understood from this that just like it's forbidden to go in the ways of the nations and the, and the customs and the practices of the nations, can also it's also forbidden to go in the customs and the practices of the atheists that Cain cast of a safer brismasha. And so too it is written in the ways of um in the book of the covenant of Moses. Now, this comes to a very, very important point over here. We, we've learned before that atheists are worse than idolaters because an, an idolater, at least he is understanding that there's a higher power and he may miss allocate what the higher power is. He may misunderstand what the higher power is. He might try to associate a foreign god with the true God Almighty and try to make a mix-up of all kinds of different powers and so forth. And that's obviously falsehood. It's forbidden. And God Almighty says it's forbidden for every single human being. But an atheist denies that there's any higher power, denies that there's anything spiritual, denies that there is any purpose to creation, that it's, he believes that it's just something that came about as a random accident, which is an attack on not only God, but it's an attack on every single human being because it's denying the the inheritance to every human being 
the divine gift of knowing that you were created in God Almighty's divine image. So therefore, it is forbidden to follow in their customs and their practices of the atheists. And I would like to suggest a few examples of this for you to consider. And you may be able to think of more examples which you could present either now in the comments and the chat, or you could present on YouTube comments and so forth of other examples of this. But a few come to mind. One is that it is the practice of the atheists, the Marxists particularly, to use what is called in common, common parlance, it's called the, uh, the peace symbol, which is really a symbol of revolution. There's a whole question, what is the source of this, and is it an anti-Christian symbol, and so forth. But w whether or not it's an anti-Christian symbol, it's certainly a symbol that's associated specifically, and it's customary for the Marxist atheists to use this symbol to represent what they call peace. But peace, in the words of Marxism, is really a code word for war. And they are using this for destruction, and they use it in their campaigns against uh, for nuclear disarmament is one of the first source uses of this. And then it's become very prevalent bumper stickers and, and t-shirts and all kinds of ways that this quote-unquote peace symbol is used. Now, you are a God-fearing person, a God-fearing Jew, a God-fearing non-Jew, and you are going to write an article about peace. And so I saw this as an example, a tragic example of not understanding and not being attuned to what the reality in the world is, that there was an article on Chabad.org about peace and the peace of the, the, the Torah's peace. The Torah is all about peace. The Torah is the ways of the Torah, peace. The Torah is promoting peace. And the Torah is talking prophecies of the coming peace for the entire world. With era of messianic era is complete shalom and peace and, and goodness for the entire world. And in the little image that they have for this article on peace, they have a peace symbol. Now, the person, I'm going to assume that the person who wrote this article is ignorant of the fact that the peace that the Marxists are referring to, and that symbol is used for a symbol of war of the atheists. The Marxists are the stormtroopers of the Enlightenment, which is the intellectual branch of Amalek. It's the 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 all. It's one unified movement to degradate humanity and to disconnect people from their creator and disconnect people from their soul. And it is inappropriate to use this symbol. Because not only is it inappropriate to use the symbol because it's it's a Marxist symbol, but now someone's coming along and a Jewish or non-Jewish person who's coming along and reading this article on Chabad.org about peace, and he sees the communist symbol of warfare masquerading as a peace symbol, and he realizes one of two possibilities. If he is malamet schus. If he has the patience to say, oh, well, uh, it must be a mistake. It must be that the guy who is doing the article or the image, the guy who collects the images for the articles, he searched online and he searched the word peace and he sees this symbol for peace. He doesn't think about what it is. He doesn't understand the controversy about whether it's an anti-Christian symbol, an anti-religious symbol, whether it's a Marxist symbol. That's not in his head. And he just put it up there without thinking. That's if you have a patient reader. A person who's just coming to jumping to conclusions is going to say, oh my gosh, Chabad.org is, is using Marxist communist symbols. And that casts a an aspersion on the entire content of the article because the entire article, content of the article is promoting genuine peace in the world according to the vision of the Torah, according to God Almighty's vision, according to the Torah, according to the prophets. And now this person is associating in his sloppiness, a Marxist communist symbol which comes to undo everything to do with um, the, the, the teachings of the Torah and undo everything with God Almighty. So that's an example where that's called walking in the ways of the atheists. Because 
even the Christians, uh, uh, Christians, serious Christians would not use that symbol because they um, they they believe that it's an attack on their their beliefs, their their beliefs. Even though we know according to Torah that their beliefs are incorrect, yet they they understand it to be like that. So a Christian wouldn't use that. Why is this Chabad.org using it as a Marxist uh, communist symbol? Because it's it, it, he shouldn't use it. Because it's it's a false symbol and it's an inappropriate symbol and it's offensive to many non-Jews, and it is, in fact, send walking in the ways of the of the nation of, of the atheists. <coughs> Let me give you another example. So one of the ways of the enlightenment is to switch around terminology and to use it to connote the opposite. So for example, one is the word enlightenment itself. The en en enlightenment, a lot of the words of, of um, reverse meanings in the uh, ways the enlightenments and the secret societies evolve actually around the word for light. So the word enlightenment means, according to the official definition of the enlightenment, it means to make light bring real light into the minds of men to realize that their former beliefs in god and their former beliefs in a in the divine chain of tradition and divine commandments from the beginning of time are false because now they are enlightened and they are freed from all the restrictions that the torah has for mankind and from all the limitations on morality and all the limitations on murder and so forth and that's and that's how the enlightenment works because if you could as you go long later in the enlightenment the first stage of the enlightenment was to set the stage for this you get later on to the philosophy of the enlightenment you see that it all is promoting murder euthanasia abortion all utilitarianism all these murderous concepts and immorality and no code at all and and it infiltrates into biology and physics and teaches everything's random and teaches that there's no purpose to life and that there's god forbid and there's no moral code for life god forbid all these things are the direct intentional result of the enlightenment but they couldn't teach those things at the very outset so it took a few hundred years for this to become as people accepted the la the, the most recent advance of the enlightenment the most recent um chilling effect of the enlightenment then it goes to the next stage so the word enlightenment actually means to darken they're using it to say they're going to bring light to people's minds to be able to have them see the truth, but they're really darkening man's perspective. They're bringing a, about a darkness. So the enlightenment is really a darkness. So you, a person has to be very careful not to use that word because the word enlightenment is an inappropriate word to use because it's been co-opted by people who are fighting against God Almighty. The atheists are fighting against God Almighty, and this is the word they use, enlightenment. So when you're going to speak words of Torah, when the Torah says, for example, that the, the, the Torah, in teachings of Torah from thousands of years of teachings, it says that the Torah is going to, you know, make bright our eyes, meaning to say that we're going to become, we're going to come to be able to see the world correctly. We're going to see that there's nothing besides God Almighty. We're going to have caring and compassion, a love that's guided according to Torah for our fellow human being and the proper discipline, the proper, all the different things that we're going to have as a well, a well built human being created in God Almighty's divine image. And someone's going to come along and translate that or write about that and write about it as if it's, he's enlightened. You just use the, a, a term that's relate that's used by the atheist, and now you are using it in your translation or explanation of a Torah concept that is going in the ways of the atheists. And you have this problem particularly if you have a person who's university educated because he doesn't grasp that his whole thinking has been shaped he doesn't really understand the meaning of the words that he was taught in university and he tries to use them as a <laughs> wise way of of translating torah because he's sophisticated these are sophisticated words so he's going to use that another example is the word uh, we know that the word illuminati 
which is a, a secret society that was created in the late 1700s, Adam Weishaupt, with the intention of being the final organizing force for Amalek to bring about its, uh, finalize its war against God Almighty, is uh, using the word Illuminati. And Illuminati means they, again, the same concept, illuminating, illuminating, enlightenment. These are the code words they use that they are going to, so to speak, illuminate the world with the darkness of the denial of God Almighty. And separ- as the, the, what, what is the, what is the uh, agenda of the Illuminati? It's to destroy the knowledge of God in the world, to destroy the family, to destroy the economy, to destroy society. Um, destroy parent-child relationships, destroy the marriages, everything that is the foundations of civilization. This is the job, this is the mission of the Illuminati. And according to contemporary writers at the time, the Illuminati was successful in co-opting the Freemasons and other secret societies and semi-secret societies until, according to Rabbi Moshe Entelman and to illuminate the opiate, the Illuminati is basically the progenitor and the controlling um, decision maker and, and driving force behind all the secret societies today, including Marxism and and uh, and communism and all these different at the highest levels, much higher than the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission and Bilderberg Group and all these different types of things which people like to point to and the Freemasons even, people like to point to them, um, but those are not, those are just more mass public-facing organizations, whereas, according to Admiration Moshe Enthelman, the Illuminati is the one that's behind the scenes that at the very, very, no one know, knows the names. Anyone who talks about the know so-and-so head of a foundation is the, you know, the, the leader of something. All the people that we know their names, according to Rabbi Enthelman, are just, would be just poster boys for the different parts of the movement, whether it's in public health or and atheism or science, uh, atheist science and and uh, anti God teachings and and the revolutionary teachings and in in, uh, in, in uh, immorality and all these different aspects of life, those are just anyone that we know about are not the real real thinkers. They're kind of like the opportunists who try to rise to the superficial head of the um, system but are not really anyone with any real power or decision-making or real insights into the, the nature of what's really going on, what the warfare is. So given all this, then you have to understand that this word Illuminati is something that is a code word for bringing darkness. So people are ignorant of that, and they will talk about the illumination of godly light. And they are qu- quoting from a Torah source, it says, Lahayir, or it says, uh, or uh, there's a ray, a radiance of godliness, and they translate that as illumination of light. But that's clearly not the intention of the writers of the Torah works in their original to have any association whatsoever with this war against God Almighty. And so the people that are mistranslating are going in the ways of an atheist by using terminology that the atheist co-opted for those purposes. Now, also, the same concept is, would apply we, once we understand that a university, which is an instrument of the Enlightenment, is created in the model of a secret society with a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctorate degree, and so forth, that these are all levels, bachelor's, master's, doctorate, are all levels of the society, and uh, it's supposed to be the secret society, although it's open to those that are qualified and can pass an admission test, and there's all kinds of you know, hazing processes to get into these universities and you have to pass a certain type of test and go through interviews and all kinds of stuff to be qualified to become a receiver of their um, manufactured uh, wisdom and manufactured information. And the end result is a person then gets in there and he goes to the bachelor's level, the master's level, the doctorate level, and he is trained in a way of thinking that says that information Knowledge and wisdom is exclusive to, to the area, to the universities. The only people qualified to speak <coughs> in a particular subject is someone who has a degree, like the secret societies have degrees of 13 degrees. Different societies have different number of degrees. And uh, what these universities do is they model themselves on that. And they basically occultize the na- mind of the person to think that 
they are therefore, because they got this degree, they are qualified to speak up to the level of the degree on this issue. And whoever is above them is more qualified. And there's this cult of experts and only the people at the very top are really, really qualified to speak. And that's those are the people they get called into the media to speak as the experts in particular subjects. And the end result is that it, their their religion, their religious atheist view is that everyone else is unqualified to speak. There's no role for common sense. It's whatever the experts have to say. And this is this is the religious movement of the atheists. This is how they corral human beings into this viewpoint that is a, is, fo, is fomenting the mission of Amalek through the Enlightenment to delegitimize the divine wisdom that's found in every single human being and then to use these universities and colleges as brewing pots for more and more advanced degrading of the human condition more and more advanced degrading of the human mind that the end result is just chaos everywhere default to collapsing civilization collapsing marriages collapsing children collapsing people lives ended prematurely and and warfare and all these products and economic chaos and and class warfare and all the marxist tools are used in the created in these uh, uh or fomented in these universities as the brewing place for the the um, more and more revolutionaries so <clears throat> therefore if you were but we see that in the um in the Torah, the way the Torah tells us to conduct ourselves, there is something called a yeshiva. A yeshiva is not a university. It's not a college. It's, an, it's a place of coming to learn Torah with people who have already learned Torah. And to learn Torah, everyone's able to enter the, to the yeshiva to learn. And everyone is able to surpass his teacher. And we see that in the Torah and recorded in many different cases throughout history where the student far exceeded his teacher in his capacity and his ability to learn without any degree, without any, um, without any, uh, what would you say, uh, without any degree, without any certification even. And while there is something called smicha, which is a uh, literally laying of the hands of the of a, a senior rabbi from a previous generation on the younger a, a, a rabbi, younger rabbi from a younger generation to indicate that this younger rabbi has really grasped the concepts of the Torah and he is qualified to be a teacher because he's got the point and he's got the message and he's got, he's got the enthusiasm for the mission to reach the, every single human being and to, to be a leader among the Jewish people to uplift the Jewish people to be role models and leaders for the entire world, while there is such a concept of smicha, but that smicha is not exclusive, meaning any person who is dedicated to learning Torah is able to come and get that smicha. So you could have even a person, uh, a Jewish person who's unfortunately born from an inappropriate relationship, but yet he is able to acquire the highest levels of Torah learning, and he's able to become a most respected teacher because he the question is about the each individual where is he right now in his intentions in the service of god almighty is he directing himself in his choices in his thought speech and action in accordance with the teachings of god almighty and transmitting those authentically to every human being is he living up to the highest example of emulating those teachings him in his own personal life and teaching other people then then he is somebody who is fitting to learn from him. But if he does not show and exhibit and, and, and show uh, and emulate the great leaders and teachers of all time, and he does not himself have a personal example in his own life, and he does not be, well, no one's perfect, but at least he's striving to be the best possible human being and the best example of what it means to be a son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then he is 
willing to do that and he's willing to pick himself up and correct himself and get himself back on track time and time again and he's willing to be dedicated to the service of god almighty then that is what is, is a person fitting to learn from but it's not based on his degree his degree does not confer he doesn't have a degree even this this um this smicha does not confer on him any authority he has no authority based on the, the smicha the authority comes from his living example of emulating the Torah and cleaving to the authenticity of the Torah and to teaching it, learning it and teaching it authentic, authentic, authentically. So if a person tries to create a merger of somehow he's going to teach Torah, but using a university system, then it is going in the ways of the atheists because he is not understanding the whole concept of this degreeing system is while it seems convenient and appealing for creating a way of testing somebody and saying you passed a certain thing but nonetheless it is emulating and it is going in the path of the atheist to create a degree system. The degree system is going in the path of the atheist. So I want to encourage everybody who has would have such a thought to do such a thing, to reconsider and realize that that's not the appropriate way to do it. The appropriate way to do it is to say you could have a introductory level. Um, you could say that we are now, like you have in yeshiva, you have beginners, uh, chumash, and you have more uh, intermediate and more advanced chumash based on a person's facility and his fluency. And anyone could go from one to the other, but you don't get a degree from each one. You get a, you you know when you're ready for the next level based on your fluency. Same thing in learning Talmud. Same thing in learning halacha. You can have people, so to speak, streamed based on their, um, based on their learning level and their their ability in it. But the other reason we don't give degrees is because a degree implies a level of completion. And the reality is that a person, any person who's received smicha knows that when he receives smicha, he's just really beginning. It's not a degree. He hasn't, he hasn't completed something. It's just an indication that he spent time studying a certain material and he was asked a, a limited number of questions about that material. And he showed that he was familiar with the material and was competent in the material, but it does not mean that he has now a degree because his life of learning that is has to be constantly, constantly relearned. And everything has to be relearned and learned deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is what how Torah learning is set up. So it's, it's a lifelong process. And this applies for the Torah learning that's required for non-Jews also. As the Ramah Mafano writes, one of the 30 commandments is that a non-Jew must be busy that applies to the non-Jews, that he must be Isaac and Torah. And a non-Jew who is Isaac and Torah is considered like the high priest in the Holy Temple. Now, what does this mean? It means to say that the learning of Torah, that he's considered by like the high priest, the high priest is the holiest man in the world who is the representing the, the children of Aaron and uh, the, the priestly family in service of the, of the Jewish people and the children of Israel in service of the entire world. And he's the only one that's permitted to go into the Holy of Holies in the Holy Temple, in the Holy City, in the Holy Land. This is a state of holiness. It's not a state of intellectual capacity, intellectual prowess, intellectual mastery, data collection, data regurgitation, um, knowledge. That's not what it's about. It's about a state of holiness, state of connection and dedication to the service of God Almighty. So when we when the, the Ramah Fano writes in this and the, and it's written in the Gemara and the Talmud that a non-Jew who learns the Torah that applies to him is like the holy priest, the high priest that's serving in the holy temple in the holy of holies, and and in the, in the holy temple in the holy land. This is an indication of the state of the person's connection and, the, and the, how God Almighty views this person, how we're supposed to view this person in the, in the beauty of his connection to God Almighty. 
It's not an intellectual certification. It's not a degree. It's a recognition of where his heart is directed and how he's using his time. And it's an approbation from God Almighty that this is considered like God Almighty, like this person is like the high priest. So we could see from this the distinction between the Torah approach and the ways of the atheists. And we have to be careful not to do anything that would capture the images from the the um, the uh, from the atheists, or to use the terminology of the atheists, or to use the systems of the atheists. We have to be very, very careful about that. Because it is that is considered walking in the ways of the atheists. And that's not something that we want to be doing. It was something we want to stay away from, and both because it's but ways that atheists are falsehood, as we've discussed it, but also just doing using it is creating confusion in the world and that somehow it's now under <laughs> endorsement or if a person's perceptive and he sees it, he's going to not want to learn the Torah that's being taught because he's going to see the use of terminology that he knows is associated with atheists and he doesn't want to get anywhere close to anything that's promoting atheism and he'll misunderstand that the translate is not he won't realize that the translation is mistranslated and and appropriating terms that have been appropriated by the atheists and therefore the person who's translating it or writing it is speaking incorrectly or misusing the words of Torah and he will come he'll say he doesn't want to learn this Torah God forbid so that is a key key essential point over here that I, and that's why I spend time on this because it's something that I see time and again and it's something that's troubling because people are doing it mostly because they're not aware now interestingly over here if we could look at both paragraph 10 and paragraph 11 we learned that one of the reasons we're not doing this because not only we don't want to emulate the ways of the idolaters or the ways of the atheists but because there are certain groups of people that make it their business to attack the Jews at every opportunity and to attack the children of Israel at any, at any, every opportunity to say, oh, you see, they're doing like this. You see, they are doing the wrong thing because look what they're doing and to challenge the children of Israel for doing things that don't seem to meet the standard or like in the case earlier, they're going to say, oh, you're, you're doing these things because you're, you're doing it like the idolaters and you're really doing the slaughtering your cow in order to sacrifice it to the angel of the sea. All these kind of accusations. But there's people out there who are looking for this opportunity. Now, you and I, if we hadn't learned that Talmud, that Gomorrah, uh, we would have been walking along and we would see a guy slaughtering his his um, you know, religious Jew. He's slaughtering his uh, cow and the blood is flowing into the sea and we're like he, I guess he found a convenient place not to create a mess because the water blood is going to be diluted in the sea and, and it wouldn't occur to us we don't know anything about worshipping I, I, idols and worshipping angels of the sea and so this is not not nothing we know about and even if you did know some people worshipping idols of the sea and you said oh that's 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 something that maybe you know but oh this guy would never be doing that he's not worshipping the idols of the sea <laughs> or, or worshiping his own reflection in the water in the in the little pit in the in the marketplace. But we'd say, ah, that's not what he's doing. He's not thinking about that. He's just slaughtering an animal and the blood's flowing into the into there. But yet the Torah is telling us that there are people who make it their occupation to come and make accusations against the children of Israel and say that, oh, your real intention is to have this nefarious intention, to have this negative intention to go. And and sacrifice to the angel of the sea, or to sacrifice to your own reflection, and and uh, so forth. So, what does this tell us? This tell us that we have a special duty to be on guard because there are people out there like this. If you go onto the internet, you'll find countless articles and websites picking apart points where a Jewish person said or did something that was done and said without proper consideration for being 
careful with what he's saying and careful with the images he's using, careful with the terminology he's using, careful with the models which he's emulating. Uh, those are the three aspects that I spoke about before in terms of not emulating the ways that atheists don't use their images, don't use their terminology, and don't use their don't use their practices, their, their systems. By the way, there's another one I just want to mention is that when it comes to teaching the Shabbat Mitzvah, one of the things that is very, um, unfortunately, prevalent is talking about universal laws and, and uh, you know, these kind of terminologies or they'll use, people will use United Nations and so forth. And it's a big, big problem. First of all, one of the anti-God movements, movements out there is to create ecumenicalism. And that is something that's meant to create one world religion and basically merge all the world religions and say everyone believes in the same thing and they're all the same and they all want the same nice ideas and therefore universal. Uh, well, that's, that's something that we do not believe in. While we know that Torah and applies to every single human being and we know that Judaism includes already every single human being because every human being has a divine purpose and role in Torah and in Judaism as a Jew or a non-Jew. There's no need to convert. And everyone is promised who can, every human being who takes upon himself to do the commandments of God Almighty because God Almighty commanded them on Mount Sinai through Moses, our teacher, is assured. It's called Hasidic and Musa'ilam, one of the Hasidim of the nations of the world. He's assured of a portion of the world to come. So Judaism already includes every single human being. So we do not believe in a universal religion, but we believe that every human being is going to come to recognize God Almighty. But the problem with the universal religion idea is that something that that's a term that's been co-opted by people who are promoting an anti-God agenda. So we don't believe in the universal the way it's being used by the anti-God people. So don't use it in a Torah concept a context even to the extent that you believe that the word universal could be used interchangeably so to speak but that's not the intention of the Torah the Torah is not in universal as the anti-god forces intend as the ecumenical int forces intend so don't use it use terms that refer to the fact that the Torah is from inception given to provide divine guidance for every single human being that conveys the point that the answers to everyone's issues is found in the Torah. And the warnings about all the problems we're going to face are also found in the Torah. And the solutions are found in the Torah. <coughs> you don't have to start using a word universal. Same thing as with the word United Nations. The United Nations is a specific organization that was created as a successor to the League of Nations. And the League of Nations was defined by the previous Lubavitch Rebbe and the Munkach Rebbe, his contemporary and peer, as the greatest threat to the children of Israel. That the intention of the League of Nations is being brought together to, to actually make war against God and against the Jewish people. And the United Nations is the continuation of that. And everything that they've done is a continuation of that. And they co-opt in their United Nations building, they co-opt biblical prophecies to try to look like they're the fulfillment of the end times visions of the Torah, but they're not. They, they want to accomplish the exact opposite, a totalitarian regime like the Tower of Babel was. So the Torah talks about, and the prophets talk about this vision of all the nations together and ev everyone's going to be serving God Almighty with a unified intent and, and, a, and, a, and a common intent. So we have to be careful how we refer to that. We can't call it United Nation. That, I say, should be referred to as Nations United. The nations as independent, sovereign nations. Each one under God Almighty. Each one guided in its own unique circumstances, its own unique customs, its own unique beautiful people and beautiful ways is going to be connected to God Almighty under the sovereignty of God Almighty, but sovereign into themselves, making own decisions for their own area territories, and the people will be making decisions that are best for them in their own areas, 
under righteous leaders that they are confident are conducting themselves according to the Torah as it applies to every single human being, all those nations will be at peace and serving the common goal of greater abundance for the entire world. And all the people from all those nations are going to come to, as the prophet Isaiah says, come to the holy temple and the holy city and the holy land every week, every Shabbos, every month, every new month. But that's not called the United Nations. And the United Nations is not built to, to facilitate that purpose. So don't talk about the United Nations. If you want to talk about the state of peace in the, when the world is going to reach its perfection with the coming of the righteous Redeemer now, is the true and complete redemption, then the nations united. Let's be careful about our terminology. Don't use the terminology of the atheists. So back to my point about people who are out there looking to find ways to discredit the Torah, to discredit God Almighty's vision, to discredit the children of Israel, to discredit the non-Jews who are learning the Torah that applies to them. They are sitting there, typing away, looking for every little misuse of a term, every little misuse of a picture, every little misuse of a, of a, of a way of organization or a system. So if you're going to write in your article that uh, somehow a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding that somehow the United Nations is was created for a good purpose, the people who understand what the United Nations are really about, if you're claiming that your article is written in the name of the Torah and they understand what the United Nations is really about, that it's coming with a, a, a revolutionary march against humanity, creating chaos, conflict, starvation, and murder, and terror throughout the world, then the person who's reading that is going to be alarmed to see that someone's writing a Torah article endorsing the United Nations. And that is a charitable response to be alarmed by that. As I said before, maybe he'll have the patience to Maybe think that the person didn't understand what the United Nations is really about. Maybe he hasn't learned what the United Nations is really about. Maybe he hasn't observed what the United Nations is really about. But the person who's out to cause harm and create a divide between humanity will come and say, masquerading as a person who is out for the truth and say, it doesn't everyone know how bad the United Nations is? And look how this Jew over here is writing an article that's pro-United Nations or endorsing the United Nations or using terminology that refers to the United Nations and creates a confusion that somehow the Torah's viewpoint is envisioning a United Nations. And now he has more ammunition to rile up more people and take them in a very dark path to turn against the teachers of humanity, the ones who are commanded to bring the knowledge of God Almighty to the entire world, this person who's writing against the children of Israel is using these points to get more and more people to refuse to learn from a Torah Jew, Torah observant Jew, to refuse to learn the Torah teachings that apply to all humanity. And he types and he types and he types and they type more and more and more and they search through everything that was said and everything that was found and, and they take things out of context and mislead people. Because yes, there are Jewish people who have unfortunately committed their life and resources and their time and energy and their money to the pr promotion of revolution, the promotion of Amalek's agenda. But that's not in accordance with the Torah. That's a violation of God Almighty's will. That's a violation of the Torah. And a violation of our duty to other human beings. So, those that want to fight against God will try to look for ways in which authentic Torah Jews, authentically Torah-observant Jews, are mistakenly using the imagery, the terminology, or the systems or writing and talking about the, the systems of the atheists or emulating the systems of the atheists and say, you see, 
this is not merely some Jews who are wayward, non-observant Jews who uh, became non-religious and adopted the ways of communism. You see, you find a Torah-observant rabbi or Torah-observant author who's using the same imagery terminology or creating the same system. So then they say that this represents the, what the Torah is really about. The Torah is really promoting revolution in the world. God forbid. And the Torah is really itself coming to do all these terrible things. God forbid. God forbid. So this is what the, what we're learning today teaches us, that there are people out there with this malicious agenda. So we have an obligation to be completely engaged in bringing the Torah's message to the world. We're not going to hide from these people. We're not afraid of them. But when we do engage in the world, when we come to teach the world, we have to make sure that we don't mistakenly allocate terminology and images that they have misappropriated, that the Enlightenment and a Malik and a Marxist and so forth have misappropriated and, or created and now use those to somehow associate those misappropriated images and terminology and systems with the Torah. Because you're doing it in terrible, terrible, in your sloppiness. You're doing a terrible injustice. And one has to wonder if a person does it consistently and he is insistent on doing these confusing things, you have to ask the question, which Rabbi Moshe Entelman writes in his Illuminati, to eliminate the, the opiate, talking with the Illuminati, and it's all its infiltrations of, of many, you know, the whole worlds, uh, not only the secret societies, but the creation of revolutionary societies and the creation of Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism, what they call Judaism, but it's Reform and Conservative, which are wars against the belief in God Almighty and taking the Jewish people, the children of Israel, away from the practice of Torah mitzvahs, and also created the, Sabbath, the, 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 the Frankists and so forth. And there's all these, and we see that these infiltrated movements go back even before the Illuminati. We're talking here about the Tzedekim. We're going back for thousands of years. But they would try to get in and they would try to inf uh, twist people's minds and then they would try to attack the people who were sincere for doing things that could be challenged because they looked like maybe they're emulating the ways of the idolaters or the atheists so it's a whole subversive war game but if a person is going to insist on trying to, to, to if a person is going to insist on using the terminology, as, as Rabbi Entelman goes through the works of certain Torah books, and he exposes, based on writings from much earlier great rabbis who were contemporaries of those rabbis, they expose that the content of the works were written in code language in order to promote a revolutionary agenda using the cloak of Torah. God forbid, so we have to be careful of that also. We have to be careful and make sure that we are sitting, that we, are, we are sitting and learning, and we are constantly recommitting ourselves in a constant state of recommitment to the service of God Almighty, praying to God Almighty at every moment that we not be distracted by any stray thoughts in our minds, any inducements and enticements to honor or fear or immorality or theft or ratification of murder, all the things, or, or turning a blind eye to justice, or ratifying something that's unjust. These are all ways in which we could, God forbid, slip and be co-opted. Or practices of idolatry. Or practices of blasphemy, God forbid. We have to be constantly praying to God Almighty not to slip into those things, and not to in any way allow ourselves to become vehicles for revolutionary teachings, either wholesale or subversively or secretly or in a way that is unintentional but just sloppy. 
because our job is to bring to the world an absolutely clear message, a message that's untainted. That's the reason the Jewish people have given up their lives for thousands of years against all those that sought to get them to convert and to give up the belief in the Torah. We all gave up our lives and are still willing to give up our lives that to not allow one word, not even one letter to become tainted or changed. Because the message, the authentic message to every single human being is passed down in an uninterrupted chain from the very first human being through all the righteous and upright individuals of every generation and reestablished and cemented into the awareness of every human being on Mount Sinai through Moses, our teacher, receiving God Almighty's divine wisdom directly on Mount Sinai, is receiving the Torah as an inheritance for the Jewish people to be able to bring the message of hope to every single human being. And we have to stick to that message and every Jew who learns Torah has to stick to that. Every Jew who has gotten distracted and lost his focus on learning Torah because of his upbringing or because of his distractions needs to refocus on that because this is what we're here to do. We're here to transmit it from generation to generation. And, and while we are learning from holy books, but the real holiness of the Torah is carried by the people who learn the Torah. And that's the Jewish people, the children of Israel. And the real way for a non-Jew to learn the Torah authentically is from such an authentically Torah-observant Jew. Because you could learn it from holy books that are now translated into many languages. And that's a, <coughs> a very valuable use of your time and very important use of the time. But in order to receive the Torah in every aspect, it must be through a personal teacher-to-student relationship. And you have to make sure that you as the teacher are staying authentic, you as the student are staying authentic, make sure that your teacher is staying authentic, and make the teacher has to make sure his student is staying authentic. And this, my friends, is the way forward. This is the degree of diligence that we must exercise to make sure that the Torah message remains untainted, that the Torah lessons remain untainted, that we do not mix in any other matters, not mix in any other symbolism, not mix in any other terminology, not mix in any other systems of organization or teaching, but instead keep it pure according to the Torah's ways for thousands of years. 5,784 years now. May God bless you and all of us to keep to this and to keep it authentic, to keep it untainted, to keep it clear and ready for every single human being as an increasing number of human beings come and say to the Jew, we want to learn. We know that God Almighty is with you. We want to grab your tzitzis. We know that God Almighty is with you, and we want you to teach us, as it says in the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 23. We know that God Almighty is with you, and we want to go with you. We want you to teach us. Show us the way. That's what we're doing at RabbiSmith.org. Any non-Jew that's watching this can... Sign up at rabbismith.org if you feel inspired by the teachings that Torah teaches that I'm sharing. Then you could say, Rabbi Smith, I want to grab your tzitzis. I want to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 23. And if you're a Jew and you want to learn how to do this, also you could sign up. There's this track for Jewish people to learn how to do this, to how to be the resource, to be the source of inspiration to yourselves, to your family, and to the entire world. And together, this is the building the model of exactly what the Torah prophesies is about, building the actual fulfillment of what the Torah prophesies is about. And we see completion of that now immediately in our times. I want to thank you all for being here with me today. And God willing, we'll meet later in the week with our learning about prayer, going through the Holy Prayer Book. And we have our leaders meeting for everyone who's signed up. In one of the two tracks I mentioned, we have an 8, 8 p.m. meeting on Thursday nights, we talk about taking and translating everything that you've done 
into action. God bless you all. Thank you for being here. Keep spreading the message. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.